Greetings, precious saints, uh, brothers and sisters, Greetings. and uh, Greetings. pastors and elders and deacons and missionaries and uh, butlers and cleaners and transport workers and Man United supporters. <laughs> Greetings in the mighty name of Jesus. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening with you, saints, um, lifting up the name of Jesus, calling out to him. But my few words this evening is uh, really inspired but what Jesus had to say to a particular church in Revelation chapter 3. It was read earlier on, but please permit me to read it again. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Uh, and if I had a title for what I'm about to share this evening, uh, my title would be, Wake Up, Say Goodbye to the Lullaby. According to the English Standard Version of Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, um, John records the following. To the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Uh, yet you have still a few names in Sardis, uh, people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Uh, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I read these words. And I'm already sobered up. I'm sobered up because, um, first of all, this is Jesus talking. Uh, this is Jesus who uh, some of us might have an impression that is, you know, Jesus, gentle, meek and mild. Uh, Jesus who wouldn't hurt a feather. Jesus so nice and so, so, so simple and so plain and so humble. But this is a Jesus that um, that really wrecks all of those images. This is a Jesus that... Um, I mean, look at that word that he, he tells them, wake up. We have this word uh, because Jesus doesn't just want Sardis to hear this word. And he doesn't even want just the seven churches to hear this word. He wants us to hear what he says to Sardis. And Sardis, um, it's fascinating to hear that what Jesus has to say about Sardis because Jesus has clearly read the newspapers. Uh, he's, seen the, uh, he's seen what's been said about them on Twitter. He's clearly seen the reputation that they have. They have a reputation for being alive. But they're dead. And it made me scratch my head. How can a church of the living God be alive in reputation, but really dead? And I'd, I'd like to put it to you, saints, that as we see what Je Jesus says to the church in Sardis, it gives us a, um, it gives us a few clues as to what we need to be aware of in what I'm calling the lullaby effect. Uh, now, for, for those of you who are not familiar with a lullaby, because you, you were not as blessed as I was to receive lullabies back in the day, uh, the lullaby is that song uh, that usually your mother, uh, and on a bad day your father, would have to sing to you uh, to try and get you to sleep. Um, there was one particular lullaby that I always found a bit concerning, the one that went rock by baby on the treetop, when the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will fall, baby, cradle and all. That was a lullaby that they used to sing you to get you to sleep. When you think about that, 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 really, that really doesn't make sense. Uh, but you'll notice it's not the words that is getting you to sleep. It's the way the words are communicated. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced this evening, saints, that some of us are being lulled to sleep, not because of the content of the words, but because of the way that they're coming across. 
We're living in a day and an age where the world is telling you there's no point in kicking up a fuss because there's nothing you can do. That's just the way of the world. And so what you need to do is to stay in your holy huddles. Just keep yourselves warm together. Keep on praying and singing among yourselves, but don't affect anything that's going beyond that because really uh, you have no effect in your wider world. Um, they're, they're, they're literally telling you, why don't you just go to sleep? Go to sleep in your holy huddles. You, I'm not stopping you from singing. I'm not stopping you from praying as long as you don't pray outside. Now they're telling you, aren't they? Don't pray outside any clinics. Don't pray outside. Any, don't offend anyone. Pray in your... I mean, they're encouraging you to do what Jesus told you to do in terms of praying in your closet, but that's definitely what not, not what Jesus had in mind when he said to pray in your closet. They're getting you to try and keep your spirituality to yourself. Keep your faith to yourself. And, and, and what some of us are doing is, is we're listening to that and we're saying, oh, okay. Okay, well, I don't want to offend anyone. Uh, and my Bible tells me that I should... Uh, if I all possible live at peace with my brothers and maybe it'll be the peaceful thing to do if I don't upset anyone maybe, yeah. ma ma maybe I should just stay as I am and and you yeah. you saw that that was happening in the workplace as well beforehand when they told you yeah. oh you're not allowed to proselytize which is to say you're not allowed to impose your faith on us um, they're allowed to impose their faith on you but you're not allowed to impose your faith on them no 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 and it's a nice little lullaby we're not stopping you from your singing and your praying. You carry on and do that, just as long as you do that in your holy huddle, in your corner, on your own. And and then you get a reputation. You get a reputation. Oh, we're in a we're an active church. We're in a live church. We're we're doing activities. We're having we're having bazaars and we're having festivals and we're having tea parties. We're we're doing nice pretty things. And and indeed in the day and age that we live in, um if we're not going to uh, conform to our own agenda, they are happy that we conform to their agenda. So um, let's not upset them about issues like marriage. Shh, let's not offend anyone about marriage. In fact, let's bless the wide diversity of marriages that are now available. And let's have the church to bless it as well, because we don't want them to impose their agenda, but we're happy to impose our agenda. And so we become a church that is active, but really we're, we're dead. We're, we're, we're believers with a reputation, but really we're, we're dead. We give the show and the appearance of being a Christian, but really, really and truly, um, we're dead. And, and, and Jesus' words to us is not a lullaby. He is not there going, oh, you poor thing. Oh, look at you. Oh, look how you're, look how you're persecuted. Oh, poor you. That's not Jesus's response to the situation. Jesus's response to the situation is to say, listen, I didn't call you to conform to the world. I told you clearly in my world, you should not be conformed to this world. You should be transformed by the renewing of your, so that you can find out what is that good, perfect and acceptable will of God. And, and as we're finding out every day that that good, perfect and acceptable will of God is not a good, perfect, acceptable will of the world that we live in. It puts us at odds. It makes us stand out and it makes us offensive. It's not that you look and you try to be offensive. You're not doing it deliberately. It's your calling in Christ. Look who Christ upset. Christ upset the rulers. Not just the religious rulers, but the political rulers. Christ upset the status quo. Christ did not come in and say, oh, I'm, I'm just here to pat people on the back and say, there, there, it's going to be all right. Christ came with this word that he actually instructs the church with Sardis. In your Bible, in Matthew chapter 3 and 4, we're told that Jesus' proclamation following John the Baptist is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That message is still as relevant now as it was then. It's an invitation to something good, but it's also a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call to wake us up out of our conformity to the world around us, out of our desire to not be upsetting. And, and, and to get even worse, we notice the third type of soil that Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we're told about the four different types of soil, but it's the third one that I find very interesting. That third type of soil, we're told, um, is where the thorns are. So that the word is, is sown in, uh, but once it's sown in, it tends to be around thorns so that 
it's choked. And we're told that what chokes the word uh, are the uh, cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. Uh, which is to say that these messages that you're being bombarded with every day by different news outlets, and they're there to try and get you to be upset and anxious and fearful about the world that you live in to such a degree that you think that this is all there is. And while they're doing that, are you noticing that one minute they're telling you to be anxious and the next minute they're telling you, why don't you buy our new product? Why don't you invest in our brand new item? Why don't you get this and be comfortable? So one minute you're being afraid because of the state of, of the economy and the next minute you're being told, still spend your money in this same economy to be able to get what you can and can what you get all in a bid for you to be captured by the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. I put it to you that the Sardis church had a great reputation for Christian activity, but they were dead because they too had succumbed to being corrupted by the world. Now, you might say, Christopher, that's very bombastic and brave of you to say that. Who are you to say that? I am somebody, saints, who, has actually, who can actually acknowledge and confess to you that I too fell asleep. And I felt, and this is how I fell asleep. I, I got busy and I got busy with Christian activity, but I never got busy with really developing a real relationship with the Christ who called me. And so when you get busy um, doing Christian activity, it looks good on the surface. But behind the surface, the question is still being asked, what's your relationship really like with Jesus? Come on now. And before long, uh, you, I reached a state where I had fallen asleep. I had been taken in by the lullaby effect, hearing the song of the world to say, listen, Christopher, there's no point in making your efforts in the world because nobody's listening. Nobody cares. What we really care about is, can you get as much money as you can to get your mortgage, to get your car, to pay your, can you get that money? Uh, if you can't get that money, here's a credit card to help Based you out. Um, yeah. if, if you can't get that money, here's a loan that can help you out. And if you're struggling financially, here's an addiction to ease the pain. Here's this addiction, here's that addiction, here's the other addiction. And I'm still carrying on with Christian activity. Why? Because, listen, at least you look good. At least you look the part. But tonight, I believe that Jesus isn't just arresting me and telling me to wake up. He's telling us all, to a degree, to wake up and say goodbye to the lullaby. Say goodbye to those words that are trying to infiltrate our hearts and our minds as a church and tell us that we are ineffective and we're useless unless we conform to the world around us. We must know that this Jesus that we're singing about, he is glorious. This Jesus that we're praying to is glorious. This Jesus that we're believing in is wonderful. And when he says to repent for the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom that he is presenting to us is the greatest kingdom ever. It's far, it's far greater, um, if I can put it this way, it's far greater than either the Conservative or Labour Party can offer. It's far greater than any American can offer. It's the greatest kingdom ever. Why? Because the ruler is the creator of the universe. Imagine that. The one who created all that is, is capable of allowing you to live in a rule where he can tell you, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't find that level of security in that West Bank. I don't know about you, but I don't find that level of assurance in the world that I live in, in the school, in the hospital, in the government, in the media. I don't find that level of assurance. But listen, the lullaby is still there and they're still trying to grab you. And if we're not careful, like the Sardis church, we will hear a strong word from Jesus that's, that says, if you don't repent, I will come like a thief in the night and you won't even know I'm coming. He's talking to a church. And yet the same Jesus that warns us is the same Jesus that gives us a way of escape. He's the same Jesus that informs us this evening that if we go back 
and repent and return to what is most valuable. If we go back and we see again how wonderful and marvelous this Jesus is, if we go back and return to the roots of what this gospel is all about and how it takes us out of darkness into light, if we go back, if we return, if we repent, if we're sorry and if we turn from our wicked ways, not only will God respond, but God will open us to the opportunities around us. The same world that is telling you you can't is the same world that God says you are called to make a difference. You are the light of the world. That's who you are. And it's time that we're awake to that. And it's time that we're excited about that. And it's time that we're prepared to repent Uh, from where we were going, and turn again to the wonder and the marvel of who Jesus is. I'm so in love with this Jesus because he really does want us to um, be everything that he's called us to be. Let me me wrap up then with this final word that we find in Romans uh, chapter 13, particularly verses 8 to 14. I want us to see again what Jesus says to encourage us to wake up out of our slumber, wake up out of our Um, situation. Um, Paul encourages the church in Rome with these words. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in the word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Uh, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Uh, The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let's cast off the works of darkness, and put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in the orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarrelling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We have our answer here, saints. We repent, we turn to Jesus, and we put on Jesus. It's not my life I'm living anymore. It's the life of Christ in me by his spirit. I'm not living to gratify my flesh. I'm not living for my comfort. I'm not living to be content and live to the standards of the world. I'm not living to my fears and anxieties. I'm not living to the deceitfulness of riches. I am living by the life of Christ in me that opens me up and makes me awake and aware both to the dangers and the opportunities that are present for all those who put their trust in him. I love the word and what I love about the word is that Jesus tells the church inside us that listen there are those who have not soiled their garments and they will be robed in garments of white and not only will be being robed in garments of white, get this, we're told that Jesus will confess their names to his father. And I want us to be awake so that we can be alert and ready for the opportunity to hear our saviour and our Lord declare, this is your son, this is your daughter. These are those who were have gone through great tribulation, who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and they have not been soiled by the world, but they are pure even as he is pure, and it, and it does remind me of this wonderful word, saints, that we're told in First John that, beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he appears, we'll be like him, for we will see him as he is. And then there's this bit, those who have their hope in him purify themselves as he is pure. 
And so I encourage us as saints, let's wake up. Let's wake Let's wake up to our issues. Let's wake up to the fact that Jesus is highlighting areas that we need to repent from. And then let's wake up to the opportunity that we have to really shine brightly like never before about the glory of our wonderful Jesus and let the world know that it's not them that wins, it's Jesus who wins because he has already had the victory on the cross and he, we're just waiting for the time that he returns and he returns to issue in his glorious kingdom in full as we get to experience it, as we choose to repent, turn to Jesus and wake up and say goodbye to the lullaby in Jesus' name, for his name's sake. God bless you, saints. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. Him. Hallelujah.